Here is Oregon, a place to lift and celebrate the very best of Oregon. Thanks to our exclusive auto partner, Subaru, for being a proud supporter. Get the good stuff every day at hereisoregon.com or follow us on your favorite social media platform at Here is Oregon. Share the good. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Peak Northwest, an outdoors and travel podcast by the Oregonian and Oregon Live, dedicated to the adventure and exploration of our beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm Jamie Hale. And I'm Vicki Connor. Together, we take you to some of the most beautiful and interesting destinations in our region, discussing where to go, what to do, and places to see. And today, we're taking off on a road trip across eastern Oregon, visiting ghost towns, historical landmarks, and lots of small town attractions. Yeah, Vicki, you know, when a lot of people think of Oregon, they tend to picture places on the western side of the state. Mount Hood, the coast, the Willamette Valley, the gorge. But there's really a whole other two thirds of the state that it kind of gets overlooked. And while it is a little more arid over there and has perhaps less scenic density, there are a ton of really cool spots to discover out in eastern Oregon. Yeah, I've been wanting to get out there. And I know we drove through a little bit of desert area when we were on our way to Joseph for one of our last videos. But I really haven't spent much time out in eastern Oregon, like especially in the desert areas. Yeah, it's kind of like a magical place. I like to go out there at least a couple times a year. But you know, there's there's like all just all kinds of little kind of tucked away hidden things you can find out there, uh, as well as some like really cool smaller towns. Um, but I, I love the sort of the high desert area for just kind of that mysterious element to it. Like you can drive down a gravel road in the middle of the desert for a couple hours and then just wind up at like this really beautiful attraction or this really cool little spot. It's been a minute since I've been out into the Eastern Oregon, especially into the high desert. So I, I feel like I've been kind of missing it a little bit. For sure. Uh, I, when I used to live in the desert in California, it was it was really magical, especially in this fall time when the temperatures are cooling down uh, and it's not as crazy hot in these desert areas. It's a great place to kind of escape to. When's the last time you went, Jamie? Oh, God. I I feel like I don't even remember. <laughs> it was probably last year. Um, I'm trying to like go through my mental catalog of like Oregon adventures. And I, I just, I can't picture the last time I was out there, but it had to be some time last year. I don't think it was any time in 2022, um, which is really a shame because I, like I said, I really like getting out there, but you know, Vicki, because neither of us has spent much time recently in East Oregon, we, we decided to bring someone on the show today who has. Our colleague, Sam Swindler, who is a video producer and reporter for Here is Oregon, who just got back from an epic road trip across the state. Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Sam, tell us a little bit about what brought you out uh, to this part of Oregon. Okay. So the whole reason that I planned this trip was because I wanted to meet the women's world elk calling champion who lives in Legrand. And she's 12 years old, by the way, and she's amazing. So in order to sort of justify me driving all the way across the state to meet this little girl, I came up with a road trip plan that would take me through like four or five other little towns along the way. And that way I could get a whole bunch of stories and reporting ideas and then end up, end the whole epic trip by meeting with the elk caller. So that's what I did. <laughs> what a great reason to go on a road trip. <laughs> That's amazing. And I love that you you took the opportunity to go and see some stuff out there as well. Had you spent much time in this part of the state before? No, no, not at all. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. One time I'd gone on a road trip, like a personal road trip, but I went with my husband and he wanted to, he wanted to do a lot of like outdoor things, which is not really my bag. So um, this road trip, I am so proud to tell you all that I went on absolutely no hikes. I saw no nature. <laughs> I didn't do anything like that. I was in cities the whole time, minimal amount of walking. It was really great. Oh my gosh. I love how passionate you are about not doing outdoor recreation. Yeah. <laughs> it works out really well, I think for us, because you guys are really into that and that's totally mm -hmm. your zone and your mm -hmm. lane. And 
um, you know, we're not going to have a lot of overlap, I think, in our story pitches, which is great. (laughs) (laughs) If anyone is not familiar, Sam is like our resident anti- nature or maybe anti-outdoor adventure person if you want to call it that i will go on one hike a year i will do one hike a year that's it (laughs) and i'm totally not knocking it if that's your bag more power to you but it's not for everybody it's personal choice yeah (laughs) while sam you are out there you do find i i gotta say just like the the best most interesting places around Oregon, uh, always finding people doing interesting things or interesting museums, oddities. I mean, this has sort of been your specialty and it's just so cool to follow it. So I'm really excited to have you on here today to talk about a few of the places you found out there in Eastern Oregon. So I, I thought maybe we could just sort of take it in like chronological order. So you took off across the state. Where was the first stop you stopped at? I have to look at my little list here because I've Almost forgotten. Okay. My first stop was Shanico, which is about two and a half hours east of Portland. And it's a ghost town. It's allegedly a ghost town, but I actually ran into like a whole bunch of people there. There was way more (laughs) happening in Shanico than I expected. Um, It's super cute. There was, um, first off, there's like 20 people who live in Shanico. And I think I met two thirds of the entire population. (laughs) I just kind of stopped and pulled in and it's like a row of old Western wooden storefronts. There's uh, an old hotel that they're fixing up and trying to open. It's the Shanico Hotel. Uh, reopening date TBD. It hasn't been opened since the early 90s, I think. Um, but it's like a, you know, 18 whatever hotel. Um, there was a tiny, tiny little museum in a shack and it had an open sign on it and I went in. And there was nobody there. It's just like they unlock the door and check it out. (laughs) I went in the post office. There's a little bitty post office there. It's about the size of a nice walk-in closet. Uh, Talked to the post office lady. She's really sweet. Um, Just sort of like wandered around town. There are several like shops and things, which I wasn't expecting, but don't go on a Tuesday or a Wednesday because everything in town was closed, unfortunately. There's a tiny little radio station that just opened up and it's called Dead Format Music. (laughs) <laughs> and this, they had like a little sign and it's, oh, I have to look up what the picture said. It was something like, so good, all the ghosts listen in or the ghosts are dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Just a hoot. Uh, when I was there, there was this dude who was working outside the city hall, like building something, like he was fixing the windows or something. And I talked to this guy and it turns out he's like the council president and also like the assistant fire chief and also the guy who's renovating the hotel. And so he kind of took me on a tour of the town and he took me into the hotel, um, which he swears is haunted. Um, of course. Yeah. I think anything that, that, that is that old has some vibes going on. He showed me a couple of the haunted rooms. He tells me that I met a ghost. She was standing right there. I held her hand, you know, we'll see. What? <laughs> yeah. Kooky place. Oh my God. Super cool. So did, did he kind of explain what the general history is? Like, why is this place known as a ghost town? Well, it used to be a really booming town and there's this giant barn and it has the word Shanico painted on the roof. And so if you're, I guess, flying over it or flying a drone as one might be doing, uh, <laughs> it's a cool shot. Um, It used to be really big in like sheep farming and wool farming, and it had a ton of money and a ton of sheep. And is that where you get wool from? Sheep? I don't know. I think so. It's not really my bad, but (laughs) yeah. So it used to be a booming town and then the railroad, you know, didn't go through that town. And so after that point, the town kind of died. So I go into this ghost town not expecting a thing and I meet David Long. He's standing outside the city hall and he's like working on repairing some windows on this old building. And he's not only the city council president of this town of 20 people, uh, he's also like the assistant fire chief and I guess the general handyman of town. And he's the one who's working to fix up the old Shanico hotel. And this is really weird and interesting. It's going to be managed and run by the fire department as like a fundraiser for the fire department. The fire department already runs an RV park in town. The name of which I'm going to look up because it's something funny. 
Oh, it's the firehouse RV park. Maybe it's not that funny, but <laughs> it's <laughs> it makes firehouse sense. themed. <laughs> um, cause like nobody lives in Shanico, so who's your tax base? Like nothing, but people do go by. There's a highway right there, kind of a highway. Um, and so they have, uh, you know, fire and rescue department that helps with car accidents and stuff. And actually a week after I went there, a semi truck missed the curve and plowed through one of the old buildings in the, in the tiny little strip of main street No, and destroyed like, oh my God. I know. And, and it went through the, the ice cream parlor. So no. uh, I hope they're fixing it up. Oh, I don't really know wow. the status of this. But when I was there, again, everything was closed because I don't know why the entire town shuts down on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. That must have just been a group meeting and everyone decided that's what we're going to do. Um, but there, there's like an antique shop and an ice cream parlor and a general store and a soon to be open hotel with a restaurant. It's really cute. So David was telling me that Shanico is kind of leaning into this ghost town vibe and they're going to try to make it a little like a tiny little old west town that you might stop in they're gonna do like you know fake gunfights in the street old west style um they have all these really old you know authentic buildings and they're fixing them up and it's it's really just a little slice of old west history when you stop there wow that's such an amazing, cool little place to stop. You know, it, it always makes you wonder, like, how do you call a place a ghost town when there's people there and activity there? But, you know, I like that they're leaning into the sort of old west town, uh, making a place for people to stop off and, you know, see some things or help support that little local economy. What a cool little spot you found. Okay. Well, Sam, so you stopped at Shanico. Mm -hmm. What was the next place that um, you really stopped to check out? So from Shanico, I drove through Antelope which is famous as the site of the Rajneeshi thing. Yeah, <laughs> the wanna... Rajneesh Param, the community um, from the fringe religious movement. Yes. Which we know from Wild Wild Country recently, or those who have been in Oregon for a while know it from all of the many shenanigans that ensued. Yes, shenanigans. Yes. I mean, that's a whole podcast series on that. So <laughs> anyway, I was driving through and I stopped there and – Basically just stopped and took a couple of pictures and kept going because I really didn't see a whole lot going on at Antelope. Mm -hmm. And then from Antelope, my next stop was to Condon, Oregon, which is a tiny little town, population 764. I also met a member of the city council there. I think if you go to the, a town that's small enough, like you'll definitely, you know, stand in the middle of the street for five minutes and you'll meet all the movers and shakers. So it's super cute. And the reason I was going there is... There's a secret Powell's Books location that's in Condon. What? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Secret Powell's Books location in Condon. How did you hear about this? Um, a reader messaged me about it months ago, and it's been on my list. So again, when I was building this road trip to see Ella the Elk Caller, I was like, I got to stop in Condon. So it's located in this really old brick building on Main Street. It had for a long time been known as Country Flowers and has recently gotten a new owner and is now known as the Condon Local. And it's kind of this hodgepodge of a general store slash flower shop slash coffee shop slash old deli counter slash bookstore. And they have a, what would you call that? I guess it's a um, branch arm of franchise affiliate of Powell's Books. And it's located like in the very back of the store. And they have like four shelves of books. <laughs> it is like legitimately associated with Powell's. And the story that I heard is that Mike Powell, who was the um, second owner of Powell's, his daughter, I think is now the CEO. Anyway, Mike Powell was out in Condon and he was looking for like a vacation property or whatever. He was looking for property out that way. And he started talking to Darla, who's the lady who owned the flower shop downtown. And I guess him and Darla started talking and she maybe helped him find some property in the area. And somehow it was like legit, just a handshake deal from like 25 years ago where they set up a tiny little branch of Powell's right there. So wow. they have a sign that says Powell's Books in the front. People stop in all the time and are like, is this an old sign or is this legit? And yeah, it's there. Um, the new owner is sort of mon modernizing things a bit. And um, it had a really old, funky, quirky vibe. And now I think he's making it a little bit more hip and bringing in some cool clothes and 
I don't know, Portland-esque tchotchkes and things. And he's going to feature the pals a little bit more prominently in the front and sort of remaking it into like mm. a coffee shop vibe, bringing the books in the front of it. So anyway, it's very that cool. Totally sense. check it out. Yeah. It sounds like a little bit less selection than people are used to at, say, the Powell's uh, on Burnside. It is definitely not the Powell's on Burnside. It is like <laughs> one eighth of one aisle of the Powell's on Burnside. But if you're in Condon and you're looking for a book, it's probably the best selection in town. <laughs> did you did you find any books there yourself? Um, I did not buy any books. I did get some coffee though. <laughs> <laughs> And then Amazing. I that night I stayed across the street in the Hotel Condon, um, which is a funny old little hotel, which I think actually might be haunted. Every hotel that I visited on this trip, by the way, they're like, it's haunted. I was, I was like, just I about to ask. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it might legit be haunted. It could also be that I had spent the day, you know, talking to all the ghosts in Shanico, and then I come into the Hotel Condon, and they're like, <laughs> mm. oh, yeah, by the way, there's definitely ghosts here, too. And so you kind of have that in your brain. And so I think I might have had some kind of dream where someone was like watching me in my sleep, but I woke up in the middle of the night with both of my ears popping. Like, wow, isn't that weird? Mm. And that happened exactly at 4 a.m. I looked at the clock and it was exactly 4 a.m. Wow. And I had gone over the mountain, so my ears had popped earlier in the day, but that's oh the thing gosh. that happens with pressure change, right? And so like, I don't know, that seems ghostly to me. You, can, you really can't go out to the desert without some type of paranormal activity happening. It's just, I yeah, think that's true. It's meant to be. Yeah. yeah. Well, guy. Okay. Well, Sam, you, you've talked to ghosts. <laughs> you've, sh you've shot for books, or I guess not shot for books, but seen this tiny little bookshop. I understand there, there's a third trip, a third stop you made on your way out to La Grande, um, at one of the, um, Oregon State Park sites that I have not been to yet that looks really interesting. Yeah, I went to Cam Wachung, which is a state heritage site in John Day. And it is this very small old general store slash pharmacy that has been perfectly preserved from about 1940. It was opened in 1888. And this is the same building from 1888. There were two dudes who opened it. They were both Chinese immigrants. One guy was named Lung Ong, and he was kind of like the business dude. And the other guy was Doc Hay, and he was the doctor. And he did all this sort of traditional Chinese herbal medicine, and he practiced out of there. And at the time, there was a pretty um, big Chinese population in the area because they were uh, they'd found gold in that area, and so that was a big thing. Although over time, a lot of the you know, after the gold is gone, a lot of the Chinese community moved. Um, a lot of them moved to Portland, but uh, Doc Hay and Long Long stayed and they kept their store running and they served the entire community. And uh, apparently everybody loved them. And Doc cured a whole bunch of people and treated a whole bunch of people in town, um, not just the Chinese community, but everyone who lived in town, the white folk too. Um, they have all these um, letters that people wrote asking him for help and thanking him for help and when he could cure them and help them when nobody else could. So it's pretty neat. So Lung Ong died first. And then Doc Hay continued with the shop for several more years. But he got sick. I want to say he fell and he broke his hip. And he thought that he was going to go into Portland and get better and come back. And so um, he basically like locked the door in 1948, thinking he was going to come back, but he never did. He never got to leave Portland. He stayed there. He died in 1952 in Portland. And the shop that he left was perfectly preserved, um, really, since 1940. And so everything in there, all of his medicine bottles and all of the goods that were on the shelves in the store, everything down to literally... They had these little oranges that were burning on a shrine with little cloves in them. And the oranges are still there. They're just sort of shriveled. And it's, those are the actual like, wow. oranges. It's really cool. And it's tight and it's packed with stuff. And so you can only go in with a tour guide. So you have to reserve a chance to go in it. And they only let like seven or eight people in at a time. 
Um, so it was this really like cool, fascinating look at history of both the, the Chinese immigrant community in John Day and in Oregon, and also just a cool look at 1948. That's so amazing. It's such a, a great slice of like history. And then the story of the building itself is also really cool and interesting. This is, um, I think one of the most interesting Oregon State Park, like historical sites. Um, and a place that, uh, I know that the state parks department is like actively engaged in trying to get more people to come out and visit. So they are in uh, the process right now of building a whole new visitor center at Kamwachong. That's going to, um, I think they're going to break ground later this year. They haven't really given any idea for when it might be open to the public, but, um, if folks are interested in checking that out, I mean, obviously go check it out now, but, um, also in maybe a couple of years, it's going to be an even bigger and more immersive experience. God, it just sounds so cool. Well, Sam, you, you've given us so much to, to check out already. Um, we are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about one more leg of your trip. And that is hanging out in Baker City. But first, a quick break. All right, folks, we are back talking to Sam Swindler about a road trip she recently took through Eastern Oregon. And Sam, I know you were going out to Le Grand to interview the elk calling champion, but I understand you also stayed in and spent some time in Baker City, which is a really cool town there in far Northeast Oregon. Yeah. So, um, so fun fact, I never actually made it to Le Grand because my elk calling champion was going to be in Baker City. Um, Baker City has so many amenities, and one of them is apparently great elk hunting. So uh, she was on a trip with her uncle, and uh, I just stayed in Baker City and met them outside of town. So that was cool. But um, yeah, Baker City is amazing. I'm in love with it. I'm going back in a couple <laughs> of weeks, actually. It's a really cool town. It was um, an old gold mining town, right? Back from the uh, late 1860s, and it was originally known as the queen city of the inland empire um using all the gold mining wealth to replace like those old west wooden structures like you might have seen in chanico with like these really cool modern buildings so like the town itself is is kind of extravagant or more so than you'd see in a lot of those towns out there in eastern oregon i talked to the lady who um, with her husband restored and owns the Geyser Grand Hotel. She said it's like the largest, longest preserved Old West Main Street in the U.S. or something like that. Does that wow. sound right to you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Why not? Uh, you know, we don't have to fact check on this, but <laughs> I totally believe it. It's gorgeous. Um, it's really cool. And, the, and that main drag, the street is super, super wide. It had to be that wide so that you could you turn a giant stagecoach with a whole bunch of horses. Oh my God. I love that history. <laughs> Baker City rules. I can't wait to go back. I'm going back for the Great Salt Lick auction, which is where they have like an art auction for charity and they take, you know, like salt licks that like animals lick. Um, apparently they're sort of artful in a way that they, they look like modern abstract art. So they auction them off. Anyway, love it. It's adorable. Um, I stayed at the Geyser Grand, which is also haunted, famously haunted. <laughs> of course. Gotta uh -huh. be. Gotta have yeah. ghosts. It's a beautiful hotel. So I don't know if it's haunted or not, but uh, the suite that I stayed in was amazing. It was the best sleep of my life. I went into it assuming it was haunted and assuming the lady in blue, who I was told sort of lives in the room that I was going to be staying in. I just assumed that she was there. So I walked in talked to her. We had a good conversation. <laughs> I told her I wasn't going to do anything untoward, wasn't going to mess up her beautiful room. There really is vibes in that room though. Don't know how to explain it more than that. Were your ears popping? My ears did not pop. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but but I did I did have a very nice bourbon in that room and I sat in the little there's like a little cupola that goes out and it kind of oversees Main Street and you know, chatted a little bit with the lady who lives in the hotel room. Um, <laughs> it was amazing. Wow. It was great. Get the bread pudding if you go. Oh my gosh. gosh. Ooh. It's so good. Okay. Where, where are some other places to eat in Baker City? I must know. Okay. I am definitely not the person to ask about food because 
because I didn't eat anything but granola bars most of this trip. I'll be, I'll be real with you. <laughs> I'm seeing okay. a Burger Bob's drive-in. I personally would be <laughs> going there. <laughs> I wandered around Main Street. First off, the shopping is great. I bought some really cute boots at one of these little old stores there, so I can tell you all about the shopping. Um, but every time I went into a store, they were like, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. And then so-and-so would say, oh, you should talk to this person. And, and I ended up just like zigzagging all through town. And I could have spent another night in Baker City, but I literally couldn't find a hotel room because it's not that big of a town. Um, <laughs> but Sweet, Sweet Wife Baking has... Mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of uh, really yummy goodies. And the lady who owns it used to be a WNBA basketball player who played in Portland. No kidding. What? Yeah. There's all kinds of really interesting people Amazing. that I ran into. She was super sweet, but maybe this is a good time for you to talk about places to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely can recommend Sweet Wife's Baking. I stopped by there last time I was in town and um, it was one of those spots where like you want to show up first thing in the morning when they're pulling stuff fresh out of the oven and before the, the line of people gets there to, to buy everything up. Um, really just a, a, a one of the, I think, the best small town bakeries in Oregon, in my experience. Um, I know a lot of people also go to Barley Browns, which is a uh, brewery and brew pub there in Baker City. Um, people who drink beer will know Barley Browns for their Palette Jack IPA, um, but they do all kinds of stuff. Um, so if you're a beer person, stop off at Barley Browns for sure. And um, then I I really like this place called D and J Taco Shop. Um, it's really just like this kind of low key taco shop there in downtown Baker City, but a great stop for lunch or if you want just like a quick dinner. Um, no fuss, or if you're passing through town, it's a great stop uh, to to stop off. So, um, check that out for sure too. But one of the things I like about Baker city is just kind of walking and wandering around town. There's like a bunch of funky shops in town too. And the architecture is also really cool. There's like, I feel like just so many little things to stumble upon. Sam, you kind of mentioned some of the history. And I think that's one of the things I like the most about Baker city is just all these different places where you can kind of get a sense of the history, like in, uh, the bank there in one of the banks, um, in town, you can see the Armstrong nugget, which is a, a giant gold nugget. That's just like in a display case in this bank lobby. Why? <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> so it's... I have, I have sad news to report about the giant nugget. <gasps> oh, no. I tried to go find the giant nug. Cause that was on my list of things to do in Baker city. And they have pulled it out of the display case what? because it needed some security updates. And so <gasps> it's not on display right now. I was very sad. Oh. Um, it should be back out in like a month or two, but okay. I just want to let your listeners know that if they hear this and they're like getting in the car right now to go see this gold nugget, <laughs> you're going to be disappointed. Oh my God. Call okay. the U.S. bank in Baker City before you drive all the way out there. Good to know. I appreciate the update. <laughs> Um, it will be back with high <laughs> security too. <laughs> yes. Apparently, I don't know if there were threats against the nugget or what. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, the bake teller told me it was the largest gold nugget that is still intact and found in Oregon. I think. Psh, that sounds right. It has, Another a, it has a very fame, specific yeah. weird claim to fame. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Um, one, one other stop in Baker city that I really love that folks should definitely check out is the Oregon trail interpretive center, um, mm. which is, you know, it, I, I know it's like a museum about the Oregon trail. Um, and that can seem like maybe a little dry, but they, they really pull no punches when it comes to displaying the true experience of the Oregon trail. Um, and this might sound really dark and depressing to some people, but I find it just fascinating that they do this. They have like full scale replicas of like mannequins with like audio of like, there's a, a mannequin of just a woman mourning like the loss of her child oh. <laughs> next to like an old covered wagon. And like you let's like press a button and hear her like talk about the death Crying. of her child. <laughs> yeah. And like Gosh. they have like all of these stuff that just shows like really the the straight up hardship of the Oregon Trail. Um, which again, super grim, not for everyone. But it I think there's like this this sort of romanticization of the American West in Oregon. Like, you know, we grew up playing like the Oregon Trail computer game and like Oh, it's like fun and silly. And oh, maybe you die of dysentery and that's a joke. But like, this was not a joke. And people who made that journey actually like, 
really, really struggled. Um, and I, I think it's just a fascinating spot to go and check out and learn some of that particular history in all of its truth. Yeah. I did not go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, next time. So, sounds like a, sounds like a downer. Oh, it's a big downer. Yeah. Uh, for sure. But you know, Hey, you can follow it up with uh sweet wife baking and, uh, make yourself feel a little bit better <laughs> treat yourself after that look i i did some shopping when i was there so i'm you know there you go <laughs> there's a lot of cute little there's a lot of cute little stores there's a there's a place called mad habit which is super cute i got these sweet boots that were like on clearance at a store called 1911 um and then there was this really cool um what was the name? It was called like Betsy's or Oh, Bella. It was, there's a store called Bella and it's like kitchen stuff, but it's like fancy high end, like beyond bed, bath and beyond. It's cute. <laughs> bed, bath and beyond, 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 way beyond. Um, beyond. I love mm-hmm. that. Well, Sam, it sounds like there is just so much to see and do and check out in Eastern Oregon. Um, before we let you go, I, I know it was your first time out there. What did you make of the vibe of, of the experience of, of this place? I loved it. Everybody I met was super interesting and super nice. I have a million other stories that we didn't even go down on during this conversation. Um, I, I guess I would recommend don't just take I-84 out there, mm. like get on some of these smaller roads. I, I, was on 26 for a little bit, but then a lot of the time I was just on, I don't know, long number named roads where I didn't see another car, where at times I just stopped in the middle of the road to take pictures and didn't see another thing coming at me in these long, flat stretches of Texas looking Oregon. It was really nice. So I definitely recommend kind of driving through some of these small towns and seeing what you see. Amazing. Well, Sam, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and telling us all about it. And folks, until next time, you can watch our videos on the Oregonians YouTube channel and view all of our travel and outdoors coverage on OregonLive.com slash travel, as well as HereIsOregon.com. Please leave us a rating or review if you enjoy the show. And if you want to support this podcast and our local journalism, please consider a subscription to Oregon Live. You can find details at OregonLive.com slash pod support. Also, if you're a fan of the show and are interested in potentially sponsoring it, you can get in touch with our marketing people at advertise at Oregonian.com. This episode of the show was produced by me, Vicki Connor, alongside Jamie Hale and Andrew Thien. Stay safe and happy travels, everyone. Until next time, we leave you with this 10 seconds of Zen.